my tactic is to stay calm, focus on myself, and the chance is going to come. And when it comes, you take it. I don't get so nervous about my own performances because I know I can affect my own performances. Like, I will do my best. I, I know what's happening. But I can get so nervous, nervous about other people running, like of the top athletes in the world at the moment. I'm one of the ones who has done most orienteering in his life. When I'm orienteering, I'm very much, everything is very much unconsciously like happening. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm talking with Gustav Bergman, uh, the um, member of the Swedish national team, uh, the, one of the best runners in the world for the last few years, at least. Uh, the, the, the guy that has been training professionally for the last 15 years uh, and um, one of my personal favorite runners. So I'm super happy that you've uh, agreed to join the chat, Gustav. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So good to have you here. So we've already had uh, an amazing chat before about really uh, a lot of interesting things. Uh, so I'm already very excited. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk more and the rest of the chat is going to be uh, surrounding more or less the relay topic. So we're going to be talking about um, the race where you're not, well, actually we'll get to that part. So, but I, I was going to say it's not an individual performance, it's a like group performance, but it's kind of like an individual performance and just aligned <laughs> one by one by one into three different individual races. So let's see how it goes. The first question I have for you is something that, um, a very similar question I asked yesterday. I, yesterday I was talking with Olio Yanaho. So that was an amazing, amazing chat as well. And I asked him, you know, how, what is the phenomen, phenomenon behind the relay races in Sweden and Finland? So Tiomila and Yukola, of course. Uh, but for you, I want to ask you how important are those races to you compared, for example, to the um, World Championships? Well, they're massively important. Like it, for me, it's, like my my whole like professional career is focused on performing at the world champs for sure that's my main focus uh, that's what i'm training towards and you know but and that, and like the the world like international stages you know the international races and everything that's kind of what both i aim my training towards but it's also kind of what's making me able to do this professionally because that's like kind of what funds my training like doing well on those races makes me able to get sponsors and you know it gets me to you know the to get more support from like the federation and everything uh so that's kind of what both you know everything is aimed at and what funds everything but in like if you look at the like the foundation of everything, the heart of everything, it it really is those relay races. Like, uh, it that's a huge part of what makes me going. Like, and and trying to, you know, in my career, that's, you know, not not just the races in, it, themselves, but the whole like community aspect of it. Uh, like we have, especially like in the um, in the men's part in the women's part is a little bit different in Sweden and Finland I think because uh, those it's not the same like massive hype around the the women's relay uh, hopefully that will change I, I I like sincerely hope so but the you know the hype around the the men's team in a race you know during the winter like uh, during the like I, I train like four or five times a week with the uh, Ukravina, my club. Uh and you know, pretty much every time there's talk about Timula. Like every training. It's a driving force. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's it's like a massive push for so many people. Uh and it's it's difficult not to to get affected by it, like and, and feel the excitement and it's so fun to be a part of. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, that's that's what it seemed. <laughs> and I think it's true for, for many Swedes. I remember the first time I went to Sweden, it was, um, I, I was on a business trip for my work and uh, oh. I was going to Göteborg. So I'm like, okay, let's reach out to one of the clubs in Göteborg uh, and see if I can join the training session. And IFK Göteborg, uh, they responded and they said, sure, no problem. You can join our night training session on, on Wednesday. I'm like, yeah. okay, sure. 
so it turned out that it was a training session that was aimed exactly at Tiomila and they were, they, they were doing the mass start and uh, having some qualifications for, for, for the race itself. So, um, yeah, that, that was my first first race in Sweden at night. Yeah. It wasn't good. <laughs> it was very tricky. Um, a, a lot of your walk medals are coming from uh, relay, right? So it, it seems like uh, you have to like the relays. If you would have to choose between the individual races and relay races, would you go with relays? Mm, I think so, yeah. Uh, I, I Like, I really do enjoy doing things together as a team. Like it's, yeah, orienteering is an in individual sport, but I always enjoyed the, like the community as aspect of it as well, like the team thing. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a big part of what's, of why I'm doing this. I'm really, really, like I'm enjoying this. This is, this is my, my, you know, my home, my, my all my friends are orienteers and that's like, you know, that part of it it's what really makes me motivated to continue because it's so fun yeah I'm, I'm i'm a little bit the same i feel like the all the relay races that are throughout the season they are really what motivates me to train not the individual races but the relay races right if there isn't a relay race uh, before the summer i don't really have a lot of motivation to push myself during the training sessions uh, but if there is one, you know, I want to go there, I want to perform. And I feel like I have a better motivation during the race itself uh, because of this team aspect. So I, I know that, okay, my performance is my performance, but the, uh, the time of the relay is the sum of three individual times. So I don't want my time to be contributing in a wrong way to this end result. So it, it, it keeps me going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I can totally totally get that and I'm, I'm also really you know the the times that, that i've been like most happy uh, after an orientation race it's always the relays and the times that i've been most disappointed always the relays yeah uh, because it doesn't only affect me like it affects a whole group of people yeah. like i remember like yeah it was uh, a couple of years ago at Mila and i i like my, I had like a really, really bad day physically and had big stomach problems and, you know, I couldn't perform at all. And like it, it really, you know, it felt like I have disappointed the whole team. Like, yeah. and it was so, you know, it took weeks for me to, to recover. Not, not like physically, that was a couple of days, but like emotionally <laughs> to, to get, get back to like, feeling that it was fun to run on cheering again because it affects me so much like I, I I do really really care about this uh and you know yeah but it's also like the the most exciting and, and happy I've been is during relays so that's yeah I'm, I'm very happy that you touched this topic so I want to stop here for a moment um yeah. I agree that a lot of emotions uh the uh, and a lot of memories they have um, the, especially the positive ones are really coming from the relay races um, but the, he, here is an interesting fact so um, because, I'm, because I'm coaching people so I very often talk about how you should feel how you should think about the relay itself and we've had as a national team many different experiences when it comes to relay we had a good ones, we had some bad ones right? and uh, uh, a very interesting from the psychological point of view a phenomenon that occurs is that when you fail during a relay as you said you feel very bad about it but if you put yourself in the shoes of the person that had a good race and someone else failed the relay how do you feel about that person and what we usually feel is that we are sorry for that person because we know how bad that person feels <laughs> and so so even though everybody else is really very supportive to still feel bad about yeah. it. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's something that is super contradicting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that that's exactly how it is. Like the the like I I, uh, I have failed, failed quite many times. Like it's it that that happens. If you run a lot of races, you're gonna do some yeah. things and you're gonna do some not great things. And I've 
at least a handful of times felt like I really, really disappointed my teammates. Uh, and they probably were disappointed for sure, but not with me. Like they were disappointed that everything didn't go as planned. And yeah. you know, but with me as a person or with me as a, like a perform like my performance, even with my performance, like I, that's, and that's the same thing I feel like I've been running a lot in, in relays where other people have failed, you know, and, you know, you feel like, oh, you don't, you don't get the chance to, to show, show what you, what you can do and what you as, as a team can do, but you're never, I, well, at least I have never been, I've never been like disappointed with someone else's performance. I think it's true for almost everybody. Yeah, exactly. Like you can be disappointed with the team's performance. Like, but not with the runner's performance. Uh, and that's, I think that's two different things. Uh, and, you know, you you know, it can always happen. Like, uh, like the, the, the pretty much only time I've been disappointed with someone is if I feel like they haven't done the best. Like if they, it feels like they don't care. Yeah. Like, or gave and, up from, from yeah, somewhere exactly. along the race. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, but that, that doesn't happen. Like people, yeah. people. People usually do, do their best. So, yeah. But, yeah. True. Uh, what is your preferred leg to run on a relay? Do you have a preference? Yeah, the last the, leg. The last leg, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's, uh, like, one aspect is that I don't like running with other people. <laughs> I, I, I like running alone in the forest because I know that I get affected by how other people are running uh -huh. and I difficult like when i'm running behind someone i find it difficult to be active in my own orienteering and then when i do get in front or if the the ones like go away for some reason like doing to go to different different control or whatever uh i have it's not easy for me to like switch back on and do my own thing um so i i felt like i like earlier in my career like when i was a junior i, I ran a lot of first legs and uh, and i i struggled with it i struggled with it uh, it's difficult for me uh same things that like doing mass starts and things like it's difficult for me not to be affected by the other runners so if you run the third leg you will most likely be more alone in the forest so that's, that's true yeah, the uh, further into the relay the more stretched exactly uh, the group uh, is exactly and then i will i've always enjoyed like performing under pressure as well uh, it's, it's a bit of a love-hate relationship because the stakes get so high and I, you know, I don't, I feel the pressure for sure. And I am, I am for sure afraid of failing in those situations, but my like excitement and my, like the chance of su su success, the chance of success and like that option excites me so much more than the option of failure like stresses me mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm like it's like if i if i would run relays and every second time i would fail and every second time i would like do something spectacular and win like in overall like the the positive feeling will win like so it, it's worth it for me like i i really enjoy you know that that aspect of it because when the stakes get so high the excitement of success gets so much bigger as well uh and that's something i really enjoy yeah uh, so speaking about running the last leg what do you think are the qualities of the runner that is well predisposed to run the last leg uh calm a calm runner i think that that's the most important thing uh and then like i there's always like you, you know you, you talk about physical aspects and you know exactly. But I I have I have confidence in my sprint finish. Like I've I've been in sprint finishes before and I usually perform quite well. Like especially if it's a, a shorter sprint finish, like after a, a forest race, you know, uh, I usually perform quite well and I know that I can you know push myself really hard and I know that there are few people who can run as fast as I can in the last stretch, you know, uh, but you never you never get to do a sprint finish <laughs> like in a relay race that's really 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 rare to get to those situations like sometimes it happens for sure uh and it's happened to me a, a couple of times 
but I I run I don't know how many relays like I run like international if you just look at the international relays I run like there's like it must be like 15 20 relays like throughout the years like world cups and everything and it's happened like no maybe once or twice that I've been in the sprint finish with someone because uh, it always this it, like everything decides in the forest before so and there I think you need to be calm and secure like that's the most important thing uh, and I think maybe just someone who enjoys the situation like that's the most important thing I, I don't I don't think that like I don't know I like uh, a runner that's uh, kind of slow and but really really strong and you know good orienteer that's not necessarily a bad last leg runner even though it, they're gonna be out sprinted by someone faster it, it could very well be that they are the best last leg runner in the world just that they are calm and, and can do this and can take the pressure uh, and i think that's the, the most important like ability yeah uh, it's like the, the sprint finishes are definitely a long mile observations as well it happens very very rarely if i look back at my career these are actually the relays that i usually enjoy the most when there is a sprint finish and i'm able to fight with someone um uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, it, it has a, a special type of emotions attached to it i think um and i remember those very well but there are so few of them <laughs> yeah exactly yeah 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 that, that's that that's how it is it's it's usually not like there's a long a long relay before usually so it's it's not from the last control to the finish that it all you know is decided and usually even if you're together in the forest it's usually decided already when you're at the last control because if you're ahead yeah. of someone it's really tough to pass like yeah. you have to be really close right to be able to <laughs> catch up to someone if it's like 20 meters it's already almost decided yeah exactly and that those those scenarios have happened to me a lot more like you're together with the forest but the the one who managed to be really really decisive in the end and uh, like push hard during the last orienteering controls and get like five meters that's the one who's been able to decide it yeah so um what does the relay race strategy or how does the relay race strategy differ from an individual race in your mind for me not so much actually uh yeah not so much uh i try to during the relays be very focused on myself and my performance uh and of course be aware of what's going on around me uh but that, that i am and anyway i'm quite attentive when i run like it's not you know when I'm doing a, an individual race, I'm also really aware of everything's going on around me. It's not that I miss people like running around me, like I see everything. So, so that's not the problem for me. Uh, so I, I'm, I try to focus on myself really, really much. And then, of course, like in if you are running with someone, uh, which happens quite often that you see someone in the forest and like, then it is, then I try to be really, really focused on myself uh, still. But to take the chance when it when it comes whenever it comes like if i'm running together with someone and i see okay they're going down now taking their control and they i think that's a longer longer alternative like a longer gap alternative then i uh, then i'll take my chance now i'll push really really hard and like be really like offensive and like trying to really really get away and to get the gap uh to be decisive in those mo moments uh and i i never have a tactic like i never have like a a, a plan like okay i'm running against uh, this person now and then this is how i'm gonna beat them i, I never have that it always you know <laughs> my tactic is to stay calm focus on myself and the chance is going to come and when it comes you take it Wh whenever it comes whatever it is it, it might be okay but I'm, I'm feeling strong on this like i'm running on this road and and these guys i'm running with they're they're not man they can't follow me because i'm just going to run away from them then i take that chance and just run away from them or if the chance comes oh they're, they're i think they they're running a bit like in the wrong direction and then making a mistake okay then i take my chance i take my control and i run perfectly you know uh then and of course you like these chances 
they come up and you try to take them and most likely you 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 won't succeed like it's that's how it is you know uh you can't succeed with every chance like you can't get away from the group if that's what's my, usually that's my main focus okay i i am very confident in my ability to to run around cheering and i want to do this alone because i think the rest of the, these guys i'm running with they are taking advantage of running with me at the moment so if we don't see each other i'm gonna get away from them that's like my mindset usually uh but then sometimes i you know it, the feeling can be like okay but I, i'll just wait like i don't need to do anything now because i know i can just out sprint these guys uh that's not something i like that, that's not a tactic that, that i use quite much because that feels so risky yeah. uh, but it has happened like it has happened a couple of times that i've been like okay but i i'll just do my own orienteering and let them do th their thing i'm gonna, not gonna take any risks and then when we get to the end i'll just run away from them and i've done that uh but usually i get those thoughts in my head okay i'm just gonna i'm gonna decide this at the end but then there is a chance appearing before that to decide this race and then i of course i take that chance instead uh so it rarely comes down to it um uh, but it's all, all it has also happened that that i'm the one making a mistake and someone else is is making the decisive thing and but, but that's how it is that's how it is to to run relays and to compete this way so. yeah I, i think that so so in general you're saying that it's hard to make an upfront tactics for it because there yeah. are so many things that can happen in the forest but you exactly. have to be watchful and take the chances where the opportunity occurs right exactly that that's kind of my my tactic my tactic is to, to don't have a tactic to, yeah. to be open to whatever happens and then right you decide. But, but but you also have a lot of um experience really uh and yeah. you've been in lots of those different situations so it's quite it's probably quite easy for you to spot them uh when when they occur in the forest uh i think that uh, also for people that are maybe less experienced visualizing different scenarios before the race and how they react to it i think it might help and uh, i'm i'm also so I, i've been thinking okay what would be what is my tactic for this kind of a race and uh, i feel that it's a little bit similar so i usually try to focus on my own performance primarily so that's the main goal um and even when i start with uh, with the well the last leg would be usually a very small group if there is a group but if i start with one or two people i would still try to navigate by myself but i think it changes when i'm approaching the last section of the course so when i'm approaching the last section of the course it's quite often that the last section of the course doesn't have splits anymore on the last leg and therefore um, you have to figure out how you're going to beat the guys that are in front of you and if you're faster then it's easy yeah you just you, just, you can just stick with uh, with whoever is leading and beat him during the last 200 meters uh, if you're not sure if you're faster then it becomes a challenge and a, th a, th a thing that i have been doing a few times uh, it, it didn't happen very often because um i'm actually not running the last leg very often as well uh i i like running the first one but when i'm running the last leg i like to uh, follow the leading person for like maybe one or two controls before the last three controls let's say depends on the distance but let's say the the last 600 800 meters um and really read the map carefully for the last three controls so that i'm i don't have to spend time later uh, but i exactly i memorize the, the the route choices i memorize where i need to go uh, what do i want to catch so that i can really push very hard uh, the last uh, few hundred meters and i feel this gives me a little bit of an advantage so that I, as you said i can get the last control first and then i feel like i have it in the bag yeah for sure like the, the those types of of tactics i like when i say i didn't have a tactic maybe i i like them <laughs> because <laughs> Because I, I do that as well. I try to to invest time. Usually, I do it quite early on the course, uh, like a lot earlier than that. I I try to see like okay, the end. How is the end gonna look like? Uh, how, is it you know? Is it short controls? Is it long controls? How can I do this as fast as possible? 
like these just last controls. Um, so you usually look at that before, as, as, you, as you mentioned there. Uh, and uh, sometimes I tend to, like even coming into those, those people, as, as I said earlier, like when I'm behind someone, I find it difficult to get the upper hand on my orienteering again, like to, to be really like decisive. So usually when I'm coming into that part, even though I know that it probably isn't, you know, it's just straight to the finish. Everyone has the same course now. I don't want to be behind. That's not where I want to invest the time to read those last controls because I have difficulty switching on again and run really decisive. Uh, so usually I do that earlier on the course. And when I get there, like in the last part, I try to be in front, like, and push hard all the way, uh, like all, all the way into those controls, because that feels like, like for me, that that gives me the the best feeling. I, I'm in front, I am in control of this. Yeah. And I know how to run this, like the last controls, because I've already looked at them. Uh, so that that's my, you know, my approach to that. Um, sure. Uh, all right, let me look. Uh, do you have a different mental mindset before the relay race compared to the individual race? Not really, no. Uh, I, I get a different individual mindset, not that I try to, to find one, but I'm always a lot more nervous ahead of the individual races. No, the, the relay races, sorry. Uh, not really for my own performance. But I'm, I'm, I don't get so nervous about my own performances because I know I can affect my own performances. Like I will do my best. I, I know what's happening, but I can get so nervous, nervous about other people running uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm not able to do anything because this is out of my control. So, so that affects me a bit. So usually the, like the tension is a bit higher uh, coming into the relay races. But I try to to like just be the same and just you know focus on enjoying this and, and not so much else, uh, and that that usually works for me. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, I want to ask about the people that uh, are running around you during the relay. So you said that you're not really enjoying the first legs, but you have been running them uh, for, mm -hmm. for for some time in the past. So maybe you have some thoughts about that. Uh, the thing I want to ask is that usually when uh, we are teaching people how to do orienteering in a, well, well, not really in a group, but in a crowd, in a crowd. Uh, so you're running through the forest, like Oringen, you're running in the forest and there are people everywhere, right? Crossing in all of the directions. So uh, the best tactics is to usually just try to ignore them as much as possible and focus on, you know, the, the forest features and, and your own race. I feel like it's a tiny bit different during the relay. Uh, how do you see it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I agree that there's a difference, and I'm not good at the handling that difference. I think, I think I could usually use people more, uh, but then again, I'm not. You know, for me, the the risk, like the 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 positive things of like using other people and following other people and try to like optimize uh in that way the good that comes with that also comes with the risk of me not being able to switch on my own orienteering again mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so for me it's it's like a balance i i need to to make sure that i i'm still very focused on myself and my own thing uh and not lose myself to following people uh and I have like different strategy, strategies to to cope with that. One being, I just don't I don't follow the rest. I ignore them and just do my own thing. Uh, that's one strategy. And usually, I look at the rest and see what they are doing, and I maintain my focus on my own thing. And if they are running the same way I want to run, I just run after them. But otherwise, like okay, they're running right around this hill. No, no, no I'm going going the left side. Uh, and there's also like if I do it like mass starts race my you know usually my tactic is to be really decisive from the start sprint to the start point be first there and just go like ignore everyone else uh, 
it kind of fits into your um, mindset and, and the things exactly. that you're, you're struggling with while running in a group. It's a perfect right. tactic for you, probably. Exactly. But I, but I think, of course, there are a lot of benefits you can have fine from, from running with people. And I'm like, for me, that's not really like I, I'm probably one of those who gains the least of running with other people because I'm, I'm getting more stressed than, than most people. Uh, and, but, but one thing that I try to do when I run with people, if I'm like following people for, for small sections and like that, when I, like go over to my own orienteering i try to be really really decisive to like okay now i'm switching on be really active and almost do uh like a a, a change of of uh, speed as well like okay okay now it's my turn and then i go and i try to like sprint a little bit to, to go even faster than i normally would have just to get myself in the mindset of now i am in charge again now i'm gonna do this uh and and for me, it's also like trying to do, sometimes do uh, like I decide a point where this is where I'm going to be in charge again. And then when I get there, I, I just go really, really decisive. Uh, we had we had a Swedish ultra long champs, but I, don't, I can't remember, two years ago, maybe, uh, which was ungaffled, like just mass start everyone start the same the same course and we knew that before so everyone knew it um cool. i mean not cool. It, was quite, <laughs> it, was, it was quite cool actually uh i'm like in general i think like mass starts races should have gaffles like forkings in, in some way but, yeah. but uh, as an experiment it was quite cool actually uh and then i for 40 minutes i just followed i didn't look at the map and and uh, what i did was i i invested the time and in, in looking on the long legs and you know reading all the controls in, in the end and well the problem was that i, I in the end i got really bored it, it's not fun and it's not a fun way to run or engineering i think uh for me at least uh but it was really interesting and then i had decided like on this leg i'm gonna go for it uh so when we got there punch the control i saw like and i was i was a bit behind this massive group and i waited for them to get away a bit and then like okay i'll go on, on a different ro route and just go very hard in the end we, we just came together as well but but uh it was yeah for sure an interesting thing and and what what i did was i decided like until here i'm going to be passive but after that i'm going to be active and do my own thing uh, to, to do that like consciously for me help has been help ha can help me because otherwise i keep being passive when i'm running behind people and when I'm trying to take control, I'm still passive, and I, you can't be that if you're going to run orienteering. So yeah, yeah. So I, I said that uh, that it's not cool because uh, for runners like you, there are uh, very fast, and you can match the top speed of the other runners. It's okay, right? But for runners like me, I'm my advantage is my orienteering skills, yeah. so not speed. Uh, and in, in this kind of race, I can't use it. I'll, I'll, I will not be able to get ahead of someone that is faster than me unless I just let them run forward and hope that they make mistakes. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, but as, as you said, porkings uh, or gaffles are, are very welcomed on these kind of races. And we have them in Poland as well, uh, the uh, ultra long distance as well that uh, is happening yeah. once a year is also a must start. And uh, fortunately, at least for the for the last few years, there were some very good forkings uh, done on this race, and it's been fun. Yeah. Um, does it bother you that you don't have the control description in your holder? You, you don't have the holder during the relay; you just have them on the on the map. Not not so much. Uh, do, you, do you do you like check the control descriptions every time you unfold the map to see, or do, do you just okay? I'm sure it's this one. Oh, not every time, but usually I do. Like mo most uh, most times I do, but I am running with. Usually I'm running with that much confidence that I this this is the right control. Uh, but sometimes, like I I found that you know I've got my my strategy is that if I in any way am confused or uh, unsure or anything, I check like I I check the the codes. 
Uh, and that doesn't happen so often, but sometimes, and usually it's, it's the right one. Like if it's something that this isn't as I imagine it, how it would be, then I check the codes. Otherwise, yeah, it's, a, it's a red flag. Exactly, okay. exactly. Then usually I, I, I like in general, like I look at them, the codes, and I look at all the codes to get like a quick scan, like to have the memory in my brain. I, I can't remember them. But when I, if I get to a control, like, oh, I haven't seen this number before, you know, because I, I, I kind of like, I don't remember all the codes in, in, in order. Of course not. Yeah. But I, I can like kind of recognize, oh, right. Yeah. Seven to eight. Yeah. 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 I remember seeing that, you know. Uh, so, so that's usually what I do, like on the way to the start point or when you get the time to invest, like have a quick scan of all, all the numbers. Usually. That, that makes sense. Although I have to say, I am not brave oh. enough to not check the control description. <laughs> I mean, number. It, it, sure. Like I, I usually do, like most controls I do, uh, but not everyone. Uh, yeah. I mean, but... on, a, on an individual race, I can skip some of them, not on the relay. On the relay, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to uh, mispunch something. Exactly. No, but that, that's the right mindset, I think, to, to like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check the codes. And usually, like, I do check the codes on, on the relays and it's sometimes when it's really, really like tight situations with a lot of people and, you know, you, you take a bit more risk and not look at the descriptions, but instead like try to, I don't know, invest that time in, in doing something else that might get you away from the group or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, how often do you practice really related training sessions and what are some good training types uh, that you would recommend for it? Uh, I, I run it quite rarely, uh, not so often. Uh, I actually run orienteering not so often anymore. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, especially in high speed. Very, very rarely, <laughs> actually, during the winter. Uh, but I do. Like, I do run a lot of orienteering races. And I do run a lot of relay races. And that's where you get the, 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 the best training. And then we're all, we have been really, really good at this in the Swedish national team, I must say, like during the last couple of years to have like high priority relay trainings on every camp, to be really focused on doing well on those and to, you know, not just have a relay training, but have relay trainings that are thought through that will make you have a lot of these encounters as many as possible like not just okay we're doing a must start see you in an hour but having like shorter interval form you know uh, with restarts make... like must start with restarts exactly. along the way exactly and also so not only must starts every time but have like different scenarios and and uh, different ideas of how you how you want to run it uh like maybe not everyone is training for for the last leg, so maybe your aim is just to be in the group. Uh, but but my aim is always to be first because I'm run, I'm I'm gonna run the last leg, you know. So I'm I'm gonna be in the sprint finish and everyone. Uh, and different, you know. Sometimes you go out like in the chasing start and and do those things, uh, which has been really good. It's it's always helpful to get, you know, every chance to get more experience is a good one and we've been good at, at doing that with like high quality uh, during the last year so I, I think that's helped me uh but uh, as i said i don't i don't do that so much like at home uh, not really i i don't run or in fast orienteering so much at home uh, is it because of the winter season although you're in uh, stockholm it's not I'm that stockholm snowy is, like this year has been quite bad though, but uh, but in general, no, it's because I I that's not like I, I prioritized to train other things instead, like more physical training. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, want, you want to build the form for the season first. Exactly, yeah, and I I've been like I've been I've always been doing so much orienteering throughout my my year, like all the years, and I've been trying so doing so much so much so it was maybe like 2019 2020 something I, I i'm not sure like see yeah maybe 20 
in the after 2019 season, uh, ahead of the 2020 season, when I was going to do a lot more like asphalt running and, and try to focus more on the sprint uh, towards the postponed COVID yeah. uh, walk in Denmark. Uh, and I, uh, like in in dialogue with, with then national team coach Håkan, Håkan Karlsson and our, like, his uh what is he's like a sports scientist guy uh philip larson who's uh he's, he's really good he's he's uh he's cutting edge in, in the sports science field um and good at at like this physical training part and he helps us in, in the swedish national team a bit uh so cool. like we ha- I had them and and they like together we decided that i weren't allowed to do any more orienteering <laughs> no uh, but that i i needed to prioritize other things like how many how many hard sessions can you run a week like i usually do four maybe mm-hmm. and what I want those to be like for, and for me i couldn't find the place to prioritize an orienteering training in there because i i had four other sessions i wanted to do more well not yeah. wanted to do but needed to do more. But but I think it's probably also connected with the fact that you have been doing lots of map running in the early years. So you you feel like maybe you don't need that much technical training anymore. You just need a few races before you go into the season and you feel confident again. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like my only technical training, pure technical training at the moment and for the last, I don't know, three or four years has been like specific technical training ahead of a race. Yeah, like I, I do, I do specific not like now in this training camp. I do specific technical training to be able to perform at the World Cups in Norway. When I'm home, I'm not doing any specific technical training because I don't need to. Uh, like it, 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 it's not that I, I don't think that I can continue to develop as an orienteering for sure, for sure I can do that. But for me, it's, it's more. A lot uh, other things are more important that I need to focus on them instead. Uh, but but I do run orienteering occasionally. Sure. Like I, I run with a map at, at least a couple of times a week. Anyway, uh, usually not in high speed though. But you know, so I still get orienteering done. But yeah, got it. Yeah, I, I feel uh, that I've seen this kind of pattern among, let's call them older elite athletes uh, in general. I think um, more people are doing uh, the, the similar approach that, okay, I'm I'm really good with the map already, so I don't need that many forest running trainings anymore. I can focus more on, you know, my core strength, my physical strength, my running speed, and uh, work around that because that's going to start declining very, very soon if I don't put a lot of effort into it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, doing, I, I still, like, I love doing orienteering. I love running orienteering. It's so much fun. Like I, it's, it's like compare that to running on tracks and running on asphalt. Like it's, you know, I, I get really bored if I'm just running. I, I don't like to, well, I do like to run, but not that much, <laughs> you know, uh, but running or cheering is fantastic. But at, when I'm at home, I run quite much like in the forest without the map because I've lived there for a long time. I, I find my way in that forest. Yeah. Like, so it does to have a map in my hand it's not it doesn't really make a difference like yeah. I, I i find my, and the effort needed to like get a high quality orienteering session it's not that high like i can take the car like 15 20 minutes away to get to a map and if i extend that like those 15 20 minutes to like half an hour i will get to like 50 different high quality maps uh which i can go, do good orienteering training on but the effort of doing that, I need to get to the car. I need to drive h- half an hour. I need to get changed, go out in the forest, get back, get changed again, drive back with the car, park it, get back home. All those extra, like if I'm going to do like run for 90 minutes, that's not another 90 minutes on top of that. Yeah. It goes on in log- logistics. And, you know, five years ago, no problem. I would do that. Like... <laughs> <laughs> many times a week because I love it. I, I love doing, doing orienteering. But now when, like, since being becoming a father, like having a, a kid, 
I don't have that much time. So I don't prioritize doing that. I, I run from home instead and don't do orienteering. Uh, and it's worked out fine. Like, uh, but I, I think that's also like, people are different. People are in different stages of their career. I, or I think that I still, even though that I haven't done, don't do it that much orienteering now, I'm for sure one of the, like I'm everyone in the, in the, like of the top athletes in the world at the moment, I'm one of the ones who has done most orienteering in his life, for sure. Like I've, I've done so much orienteering, like from, you know, through all through my twenties, I was like averaging like, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight orienteering sessions every week, you know? So it's, yeah, I've, I've done my, my share. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to hear that it works for you. Yeah. Um, what's the best feels good race that you remember? I don't know really. There's there's a few. Like I'm as I as I've said, I'm really focused on my performance, uh, and uh, I I have been you know struggling a bit to so much that I've been struggling to to cope with the pressure I feel for myself to perform really well mm -hmm. but when i do perform really well like it's a good feeling uh sometimes i can i can be, really be excited about my performance like oh this was a good performance uh and you know i can get a, a, a couple of those of, of those a year like i'm getting to the finish and be really satisfied um and maybe the last one uh Usually it's it's the forest races that, that gets me in that way because the sprint races it's a bit more, you know, detail or oriented for me. Uh, so when I'm when I'm thinking back, so of course it's like the walk individual sprint was that type of race for me. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we had a like my my last one I can really remember was a middle distance Swedish league last spring uh, in Blekinge, which was like this really really good race, and I had. A, great feeling throughout uh, and you know feeling really excited when finishing like so like I, I i i can really feel the feeling like to in the end coming to the last controls and knowing like oh this is a good race like i'm yeah. really really excited about this this is this is something i'm, I'm really you know, like i'm shocked with this uh so that that's when i probably when i had that feeling the last the last time uh during last spring like it usually happens a couple of years but now when i think about it so, so last year it, i didn't didn't get that much so much oh but maybe at Uringen as well like uh the fourth stage of Uringen, i probably had that feeling as well uh so that was that was good all right uh, but by the way um what features were you mostly using to navigate uh during the Uringen races i've been uh, I, it, it was my first time in mm -hmm. this area uh, around Uppsala and you know I've kind of been in Sweden several times before uh, including Oringen and Tiomila and other races training camps um, so I, it wasn't really a surprise but sometimes some parts of this forest were so similar you know to one another you could cut one square put it in the other place and it would it would fit almost perfectly and uh, I, I noticed when I was analyzing the races that uh, top runners were usually just keeping the line as close as possible but still even when you're keeping the line you have to check off some of the things so was it mostly contours or because i figured that the thing well i always try to find the things that i see yeah. um in the forest and sometimes contours were not easy to read especially when i was trying to push harder uh, but the rock walls for example were the feature where i was able to okay this is the rock wall i know where i am and uh, let's go to the next one uh what, what did you use mostly yeah mostly contours i would say uh, but of course, everything uh, that stands out to you, and if you feel like you can see the rocks more clearly, the boulders, then those are the thing to to go for. Uh, but for me, like though in this type of terrain, as you say, like just go straight. And f for me, like I've always been, uh, like you, you can you can uh, think about it this way: like you can orienteer in two ways. You can be. Uh, map to reality orienteer or you can be a reality to map orienteer mm -hmm. so if you're a map to reality you look at the map and think okay these are the things i'm gonna see 
and you look them in reality and you try to find them. Yes, that's but, me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm mostly the other way around. I'm a, a reality to map or interior. So I just run straight, see what I see and find it on the map. Ah, interesting. So I'm in first I'm, I'm running, okay, that is, is, is a boulder. Which boulder is that? Oh, that's that, that boulder. Uh, of course, you're not like you're not exactly the the one one type or the other type. Uh, but of course, I look at the map and see like, oh, I'm going to see this thing now when I look and I see it, you know. But but for me, I'm more of a like type of I'm running, I'm seeing things in the forest, and I look at my map and like place them in. Uh, so usually, I don't like. So in, in, in Lunds and, and, and that, but that's probably because I am from where I am, like quite similar terrain to where in Lunds and where Udingen was. Yeah. Uh, and that works. Like that's, for me, that's the best way to, to navigate in those type of areas. Because if you look at the map and think, okay, I'm going to see this hill and then this hill and then this hill and then this hill, you can do that, but then you almost have to walk from hill to hill to make sure. But if you're just running, read like push through and you look like, okay, there's that hill and there's that hill. You see what's, you know, uh, prominent in the and distinct in the forest. And then you find that on your map. Uh, so that that's kind of the way I'm 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 doing it usually in the, those types of terrain. Well, the, the problem I have with this is that. I feel like if you lose the concentration for a moment and don't tick off one of those things, uh, and then you see a hill, it was super hard for me to see, okay, I can see a hill, and I can see three hills that could match this on, the, on yep. the map because they are so similar to one another. And I can't decide now which one do I see in front of me. I had, I had it on one of the legs I remember very clearly. So I was leaving the control and I had to refold the map. And it took me a little bit longer than expected, therefore, uh, I, I passed some of the features uh, that I, I missed them. I didn't see them. I actually crossed the small path and I didn't even know if I crossed the path or not. And then when I started navigating, I was like, okay, did I, did I pass the path or not? I'm not sure. But what do I see in front of me? Is it this rock wall or another one? And then the, yep. the process started that for, for the next 400 meters, I, I couldn't match anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the risk like of doing that. Uh, I, and I think, as I said, like you need to have a mix of both. Like you need to look at the map and have a plan. Uh, but usually, my plan, I look at the map and I make a plan. Uh, and you, usually, I like when I'm orienteering, I'm very much everything is very much unconsciously like happening. I'm not very, you know. Yeah, I'm not very active in my thinking when I'm doing orienteering because I look at the map and then I just do because like instinctively I've I've done this too many so many many times that I like kind of know the feeling, uh, you know. But but usually I do it, what I do is I I make a plan which is really like vague and like kind of the, of the big things. Yeah. And then the details like exactly where am I now? No, no, I I decided to go go around this like or pass this big marsh or whatever but then i don't read like i don't make a plan exactly i'm going to pass exactly here then i just go and try to find the fastest way to run and, and like in the right direction and then i do that, those things but but it it helps to have like a combination of both for sure okay i got it um uh, an interesting one maybe a tricky one let's see if you'd be able to get back to your younger self 15 16 years old uh, and give some advice. What would it be? Mm. In terms I, of I, orienteering, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like in general, I, I'm not sure if I would, if I would, because I'm quite happy where I ended up. Uh, but, uh, Makes sense. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of things, uh, of course. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, like one thing, like I think could be be both in in life in general but also in the orienteering it's not to be too hectic about things and not, not try to do things you know uh quite so much and be a bit more relaxed about everything because i was like i i feel like i both in my orienteering but also in 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 life in general i could be like quite reactive 
uh, like something happens and I could be either like quite upset or anything like and and, and like react really quickly. Um, Emo emotional. Yeah, yeah, and and also like if some someone said something, you know, I don't know, political that I didn't like, I was really confrontational, like straight away, uh, and I I like that in one way about me that I I like, you know. I'm proud of myself for standing up for for my beliefs like every all the time but I think that I also has been sometimes quite you know a bit rash in everything and that that also comes to the orienteering I think like I could, could have been a bit calmer more calm and then just you know everything would have been a bit easier probably uh, but yeah so maybe that to to be you know try to yeah, exactly. To tell myself to be a bit more like reflective and try to think about things before I react, and then maybe I, I, you know, as I said, I'm I'm proud of that. I, you know, earlier also like stood up for what I, I believed in and, and thought about and and like during orienteering, I I that I, you know, did my best and like really pushed for it and everything, uh, but maybe it would have given better results in everything if I just have thought about it a little bit early like before and like made maybe I wouldn't have done anything differently but maybe I was just ever so slightly you know done something a little bit different and then would have been an even better outcome I don't know but that that's probably that yeah all right thank you last one I have for you I have for you uh, what what is in your opinion the most important skill of an orienteer oh well to read the map that's the most important skill. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it sounds quite easy, but for me, that's always been my strength. Like the ability to translate reality and to the map and map versus reality. Yeah. Uh, that's that's an ability that I'm so happy that I am and so grateful that I always have found quite easy. Uh, like I, that it, my strength has always been to quickly like be able to, okay, look at look at the map and like visualize. Okay, this is how it's gonna look like, and not be surprised, because I, I'm really good at that like three D visualizing thing, yeah. And also look at look in the, the terrain and like, and, and that's also why I can why I am quite good at this like real reality to map orienteering skill like to do that because i look at the reality and i can see like okay that there's a hill there's a boulder and that's a crag in that direction and then i can look at the map and i don't need to try to match the map to the reality because i all, already have the the map in my head i can just find it on the map and like okay there it is i know this is how it is uh and this is you know that ability everyone has that like to some degree uh and i'm very lucky to to like find it easy to to develop that skill and you know of course i've, I've been training a lot of it on it yeah. like to develop and, and it more and more and more but i think that you know even when i was you know eight nine ten years old and didn't have hadn't done so much orienteering that was always the easy part for me to translate map to reality, reality to map. Uh, so I would say that, but that, but there's, there's so much. Like if, if, you, <laughs> yes. if you want to become like an elite athlete and be professional, like I do, or whatever, or aim for rock medals, and the the like, people are usually talk like there's a classic like, oh, he was so talented and he's so talented in this and and uh, like. You know, oh, these young kids are so talented in doing this and doing that. And when I was when I was like fourteen, fifteen, I wasn't especially talented, or in like in orienteering, I wasn't doing that that good at that, that age. But my talent has been, you know, longevity. My talent has been being consistent, and that has brought me like hit to where I am now. And there's a lot of different things that you can be good at that can take you all the way to, you know, wherever you want to go. Uh, and I think that's, you know, 
a skill of its own. It's just it's not just about being able to run fast or read the map good and you know be focused during the races. It's also about finding you know being able to be injury free. It's being able to you know keep motivated uh, even after like fifteen years of elite or injury. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's there's a lot of things, but that that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want to stop you, even though you were allowed to say only one thing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. But I know it's a tricky question because it's so hard to pick from the the, the whole spectrum of things that contribute to being a very good orienteer. All right, Gustav, thank you so much. Uh, you, as I expected, uh, this was really a blast. You're a wonderful human being. I feel like we have so many things that. Uh, uh, we are similar in in terms of thinking that uh, we would be good friends if we lived like a little <laughs> bit closer to one another. Uh, so this was a, a pure joy to have you here to talk to you. And uh, I'm really grateful that, that you joined the chat. Yeah, thank you very, very much.